Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for having me at the JDG. It's really a tremendous honor, and I'm very happy that you will take the time to <clears throat> listen to my work and maybe also the time in reading the paper in advance. Um, so let me just jump straight into the main example of the paper, a, a case that I adapted from Joseph Millen's excellent work on this topic. So it all starts with him. He's a bad guy, call him Coercer. And it's someday he meets him, victim. Now you really don't wanna meet Coercer, he's a bad guy um, and he loves to torture other people. And this day he harbors a particular crutch, grudge against the victim and he wants to show him who's boss. So he tells him, look, if you don't go around that to that tattoo artist around the corner and have my name tattooed on your back, I will shoot you in the leg. And he has to, victim has to go to her tattoo artist. I call her recipient because she will eventually receive uh, victim's consent. The victim does not really want to get that tattoo. He's highly averse to getting that tattoo, but there's really no other chance for him to avoid being shot in the leg. So he goes to recipient, tells her about the situation, um, and they think about what to do. But recipient, even though she would do anything she could, let's suppose she's a moral saint, she can't help victim escape being shot other than by tattooing him. So they eventually agree and go ahead. Victim consents to the tattoo and recipient gives him the tattoo. Today, I wanna to focus on that case uh, and pursue three objectives. First, I wanna show that this case um, poses a fundamental challenge to our thinking about consent and describe that challenge more precisely than I think others have. Namely, as an inconsistency between two fundamental principles in the ethics of consent. Secondly, I want to give you my own solution to that problem. And just as a little sneak preview, I will argue that coercion does not always invalidate consent. The validity of consent crucially depends on the behavior of the recipient and not on the third party's coercion alone. And third, I want to present a novel reply to an objection that has hitherto seemed to be decisive against a, a certain type of theory, a theory that, like my view, thinks the validity of consent um, depends at least partly on the recipient's conduct. So with this um, specification at hand, uh, let me go into my first objective, the challenge from consent and third party coercion. I think the challenge uh, is one of an inconsistency between two central principles in the ethics of consent. The first one is this, coercion principle. Coercion invalidates consent. Uh, now that sounds like a very plausible principle. Coercion is very hostile to people's autonomy and self-determination. And if we think consent is supposed to protect autonomy, then coerced consent shouldn't be valid. Um, the facts in the case are clear victim is coerced into consenting. Uh, and therefore the conclusion we get that con victim's consent is invalid. But just to um, clarify this, when I say consent is invalid, then I mean it doesn't do the normative work. It doesn't give another person permission to proceed. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the only very plausible principle that we can detect. On the other hand, there's a principle which I'd like to call the permissibility principle. And basically what it says is that permissibly doing certain things like giving another person a tattoo, um, performing a medical procedure or having sex with someone requires valid consent. Otherwise it's not permissible. So applied to this case, uh, it would say that permissibly executing a tattoo requires valid consent. And just ignore this blank spot for a moment. I will come back to that later. Um, it seems that in the case, in this case, recipient permissibly executes the tattoo. She would have done everything she could to help him, but there's just no way to help victim avoid being shot. The only way to help him is tattooing him. And I think that vic because victim asks for it and for that reason, um, she can permissibly go ahead. But if that's also true, um, then victim's consent must have been valid. Uh, and you see, we get two opposing conclusions from two independently plausible principles. And I think this is at root the problem that cases of consent and third party coercion pose. 
and the challenges they want to address. But before I proceed, I have to be a bit clearer and have to make a specification because the notion of permissibility um, uh, leaves different interpretations open. So particular between, let's say, narrow permissibility or protanto permissibility on the one hand and wide permissibility or all things considered permissibility on the other hand. So something is narrowly permissible, let's say, if it's justified in light of uh, considerations that are owed to another person, if, if it doesn't wrong that other person. But it's widely permissible or all things considered permissible if it's justified in light of all the relevant moral features. Now, these two notions of permissibility can come apart. Suppose a patient validly consents to having an organ transplanted into his body. That would make it narrowly permissible. It would not no longer wrong the patient in that regard or violate his right to bodily integrity. But it doesn't, all, it doesn't automatically entail that it's also widely or all things considered permissible. Suppose the patient bribed the surgeon to manipulate the organ donation list and thereby deprives another patient of that organ who's actually entitled to it. In that case, performing the surgery would be all things considered impermissible, even though it doesn't wrong the patient. But you can also get the reverse. Suppose you twist someone's arm, thereby wronging that person. That makes it narrowly impermissible. But as Thomas Nagel explained, if twisting that person's arm saves thousands of people's lives, then it could be all things considered permissible. Now, what I want to stress here is that the permissibility principle is about narrow permissibility. What consent does is waiving a claim right or removing an otherwise existing obligation, making it the case that a certain act doesn't wrong another person anymore. But it's not about all things considered permissibility. So if that argument is to go through, we have to um, say that we have to specify the verdict in five and say that recipient permissibly, narrowly permissibly executes the two. two. So um, if it's narrowly permissible, then recipient would not wrong victim at all in executing the two. wouldn't violate the right to bodily integrity. But if it's, let's say, just widely permissible, all things considered permissible, that would still be consistent with the view that victim is still wronged by recipient. In that view, recipient would wrong victim, but sending him back um, to coercer would be even worse. So basically, recipient would have to choose between two evils, two wrongings, either send him back to coercer, which would be wrong, or um, to to him, which is also wrong, but it seems the lesser of two evils. Um, so in Millam's, Millam's paper, um, doesn't discuss that distinction between these two senses of permissibility. So I want to extend his analysis and say a bit more about it. And I think there's good reason to assume that the permissibility in five is narrow rather than wide. And I just want to give you two brief reasons for why that's the case. So one is when we wrong another person, what usually happens is that that person is entitled to an apology, that that person can demand an apology from us. Um, and kind of the wrongdoers obliged also to, to give that apology um, to the victim. But that kind of, that is not the case here, I think. Suppose they went ahead with the tattoo and then victim goes back to recipient and says, well, now you have to apologize to me. You did that to me. Um, and, and I forgive you for that maybe. But that I think doesn't really make sense. So usually, Wronging is accompanied by uh, an obligation to apologize, but that's not the case here. Um, so this is an indication that there is maybe no wronging at all. Uh, and you see a, a stark contrast to the interaction between coercer and victim, where victim is definitely entitled to an apology from coercer at a minimum. The second reason uh, why I think we should assume it's narrowly permissible is that the, the wide permissibility view basically amounts to some kind of necessity defense. It says, well, the recipient chose the lesser of two evils. Um, and that implies that the ultimate reason why recipient acted permissibly was that 
uh, kind of rests on a comparative assessment of harm. The harm in tattooing victim is just not as bad as the harm in sending him back to Coerza. But if that's true, that analysis would also extend to cases where victim didn't even consent, because here it might also be the lesser evil that you just grab him against his will and tattoo him. Admittedly, the kind of agreement, victim's agreement, makes it psychologically less traumatizing for him to get tattooed. But it's kind of in the, in the view that says it's just widely permissible, the kind of the request for the tattoo, the agreement, is just a peripheral feature. When we think uh, it's narrowly permissible, that needn't be the case, because if it's to act narrowly permissibly, I think you need to respect um, victim's request, you need to respect the residual control that victim has over that situation. So I think there are two reasons why, why recipient acts narrowly permissibly, and not just all things considered permissible. Uh, and to repeat that is because wronging is usually accompanied by an obligation to apologize. That's not the case here. Uh, and because the all things considered permissibility is amounts to some form of necessity defense, which is, which is also not um, plausible in this scenario. Okay, so if that's true, and that will remain a controversial part in my analysis, um, then we have the inconsistency between these two principles. And that is the first thing that I wanted to argue for today, and that this is the challenge of consent and third party coercion. Now, Jess Millam doesn't um, explicitly set up the problem in, in this way, but I think we can reconstruct a solution from um, his claims. So he would leave the first set of claims untouched. Coercion invalidates consent and therefore um, victim's consent is invalid. But he also thinks that even if there is a legitimate third party coercion, even if consent is invalid, that doesn't mean that it's impermissible for a recipient to proceed with a tattoo. Um, and that's because it could still be the case that executing the tattoo is based on what Millen calls a reasonable joint decision. Um, and the reasonable joint decision, quote, um, involves each party taking the viewpoint of the other as seriously as her own and deciding on this basis uh, what to do. And he tells us that this is the case in the original tattoo scenario. Um, the recipient would do anything she could. She talks to victim about it, but they jointly decide that it's best to go ahead um, with the tattoo. So that amounts to a modified permissibility principle. I think what Millam's basically saying is that if you want to execute the tattoo permissibly, you either have to have valid consent, kind of the traditional route, or option two, that reasonable joint decision. And if that's the case in tattoo, then recipient can permissibly go ahead with the tattoo. And once we make that, uh, modify the permissibility principle in this way, we don't get um, a firm conclusion at the end anymore. So the permissibility of recipients tattoo doesn't imply a valid consent anymore. I think that's a, um, a very interesting solution. And what I um, really liked about Millam's paper is that it kind of highlights that there might be other mechanisms by which people could divest themselves of their claim right and make things permissible, things other than consent. But I'm ultimately not convinced that this is the right way to go. Um, and I just want to very briefly sketch two criticisms. One is, I think, the notion of a reasonable joint decision is too strong in the end and gives us the wrong result in what I call manipulation cases. <clears throat> so suppose that the um, case is just as before, but now there's a fourth person threatening recipient with death if, he, um, if she tattoos um, victim. And suppose victim would only be beaten uh, if he doesn't get the tattoo. So victim knows recipient wouldn't go ahead under these circumstances, so tries to come up with something, manipulates and tricks um, the recipient into giving him the tattoo. In some such scenario, I think we can no longer talk about a reasonable joint decision because it wouldn't be true that 
each party took the viewpoint of the other as seriously as their own because the recipient didn't care at all about, um, sorry, victim didn't care at all about um, recipient's viewpoint. But it wouldn't follow that for that reason, due to that manipulation, um, it would be wrong for the tattoo artist, the recipient to proceed. It doesn't follow that for that reason, um, they, it would be impermissible. So I think we can generalize, generalize that point a bit more. Whether executing the tattoo wrongs victim depends on whether the process by which recipient obtained consent or agreement wronged victim. In other words, the narrow impermissibility in executing the tattoo requires narrow impermissibility in obtaining agreement to the tattoo. And I think the focus on a joint decision kind of taking into account both viewpoints equally um, is too broad to capture that point. But I don't dispute that this account could be mod modified and therefore um, align or avoid these objections. But there's a second reason why I think we should look for another solution. That's because uh, a reasonable joint decision, I think basically is valid consent and it shares all the essential, essential features with it. Just like consent, a uh, reasonable joint decision requires victims request for the tattoo. I mean, I th this is how I understand Milan that victim still has to say that he wants the tattoo. Um, demands that recipient not control victim's decision and also, just like consent, releases recipient from an otherwise existing obligation not to, to interfere with the victim's body. So I don't really see why we should introduce these as two distinct things, given that they share all essential features and can be defined with reference to the same features. Um, so for that reason, I now want to go to my second objective and give you my own alternative solution. And I'm still going to make use of my very um, patient three protagonists. So my solution is kind of based on a shift of paradigm. I want to shift from what I think is an uh, influence focus in Milan to a recipient focus in my view. I say influence focus because um, the, the, the main focus was on whether or not there is coercion, what type of influence on the consent of areas. Um, and coercion was considered to invalidate consent uh, all the time, and it, it didn't really matter who exerted it. The contrast, I want to put the focus on the recipient, person receiving consent, uh, and argue for a few that makes the validity of consent dependent on the conduct of the recipient, and not just the third party's coercion. Uh, and in particular, what I want to argue for is that coercion invalidates consent if and only if recipient exerts the coercion, exploits the coercion, or facilitates coercive success. Now, let me say a little bit more about these. When um, someone exerts the coercion, that would be kind of the, the canonical two-party case. Suppose it's just recipient and victim, and now recipient threatens victim and says, well, look, if you don't get the tattoo, I'll, I'll shoot you in the leg. You don't need coercion. But I also think um, recipient would exert the coercion if she in some way collaborated with coercer and kind of set up the scene so that he would need to get the tattoo. I think this is fairly uncontroversial. Um, the second point is about um, exploiting coercion. I just want to give you two examples to illustrate what I have in mind. So everything is like in the previous case, but now um, Recipient knows that victim would do anything to escape coercer, and therefore recipient charges five times the price for performing the tattoo. Recipient behaves uh, in the same way in tattoo in all other respects, um, but, um, but kind of charges that extortionate price. And in the end, victim consents to the tattoo and to the payment. A different case, knowing that victim would do anything to escape coercer, Recipient tells victim that uh, she will perform the tattoo only if victim has also sex with her. Otherwise, recipient behaves just as uh, she did in tattoo. Victim consents and to the tattoo and to the sex. So in the money case, the recipient exploits the coercion by forcing victim to pay this extortionate price. Recipient thereby wrongs victim, makes the transaction 
um, voidable and gives the victim a claim to compensation. In the sex case, recipient also exploits uh, the coercion by forcing victim into sex, also wrongs victim and invalidates consent to sex. So when I say exploiting coercion, I mean that recipient uses the third party's coercion to force victim um, to consent to something which even the coercing third party had not demanded from victim, additional price or the sex. And this, uh, in, this, in these cases, recipient's additional demand is not necessary for victim to escape the threat, just imposes greater harm and is not a demand that recipient is entitled to make. So, so understood, um, exploiting coercion is always specific to that particular, uh, particular object of the transaction. What I want to say is that the exploitation invalidates consent to the price and the sex, but not the tattoo. Now, the last way in which um, coercion invalidates consent is when recipient facilitates coercive success. And I want to define that as denying victim an alternative to acting on consent, which would also allow a victim to avoid the threatened harm and not impose an unreasonable cost on recipient. So consider this example, which I call mischievous. As in tattoo, except recipient could make coercer withdraw the threat, threat simply by giving him a phone call. As recipient knows, Coercer is the biggest fan of her tattoo art and would comply with anything recipient tells him. Victim asks for help, but recipient refuses. And later, victim consents to the tattoo and recipient executes it. So making Coercer withdraw the threat is an alternative to acting on consent, allows victim to avoid the threatened harm, and doesn't impose any unreasonable cost on recipient. So a recipient could easily enable victim to return to the pre-coercion setting in which a victim could avoid both the threatened harm and what victim was forced to consent to. Denying victim this alternative wrongs victim, facilitates coercive success and invalidates victim's subsequent consent. So the reason why I picked the formulation facilitating coercive success is that the recipient has now control over victim situation that normally, normally only coercer has. The control over whether victim can return to the pre-coercion setting and avoid both evils, the threatened harm and whatever results from complying with coercer's demands. In other words, it's recipient's own conduct that now determines whether victim needs to suffer anything at all. Therefore, if recipient denies the victim a feasible alternative, he impedes, as she impedes, victims return to the pre-coercion setting, slips into a role similar to the one coercer has, and thereby, I think, facilitates coercive success. Now, I wanna argue, give you one further brief terminological piece before I go to my own solution, um, and that's the following. I think I want to say that consent is obtained by coercion when one of these three options occurs. And otherwise, consent is merely motivated by coercion. Now, when I say obtained by, that's supposed to imply the involvement of recipient and in particular that recipient uses or illegitimately relies um, on constraints in victim situation on that um, coercion, as in some of the examples that I gave you. These examples significantly differ from um, the original tattoo case in which recipient did not Exert, coerce, exert coercion, exploit coercion, or facilitate its success. I therefore argue that in tattoo, consent was merely motivated by coercion. Consent is merely motivated by coercion if a person's reason for consenting is to prevent a threat from being carried out, but the threat came from a third party and recipient neither contributed to it nor wronged victim in any of those three ways that I just listed. So kind of this contrast between obtained by, merely motivated by, reflects a shift of perspective. Obtained by looks at, looks at how recipient uses or illegitimately relies on coercion to receive consent, whereas merely motivated by looks at what victims reason for consenting are. So if you um, accept that, then we get another solution to the inconsistency between the two principles. 
So I would leave untouched the second set of principles that uh, Millam's um, account would modify, but then uh, present a modified coercion principle and say that consent is invalid only if obtained by coercion, but valid um, if merely motivated by coercion. And then we can specify the facts and say a victim's consent is merely motivated by coercion in the original example and arrive at the conclusion that victim's consent is therefore valid. This solution is not um, susceptible to the critique from the manipulation case, case that I presented earlier. So even if a victim manipulates recipient into giving him the tattoo, that wouldn't mean that consent was obtained by coercion. So it's st still merely motivated. Um, and for that reason, um, valid. Uh, and I also don't need to introduce um, another mechanism by which people can divest themselves of their claim rights, something that is just too close to valid consent. In that sense, my view might be theoretically more parsimonious than the few that Millen presents. The only thing that I need is this distinction between obtained by and merely motivated by. Okay, so in the couple of minutes uh, that are left, I want to go to my third objective. I've now done two things, explained what I think is the challenge of third party coercion in the context of consent. I sketched my solution to it, and now I wanna reply to an objection. So Cursor found out about my talk at the JDG and he thought, well, for a change, I kind of, I don't, just don't torture other people anymore. I give Max this insurmountable objection and torture, it with, torture him with that. So he gave me this example envelope, a case where there's no prior interaction between um, victim and recipient. So in this case, recipient receives an envelope containing a note with the username and the password for on online banking, inviting recipient to log on. The envelope also contains a thumbnail right on it. Recipient finds a reliable and accurate video of victim writing the note at gunpoint. Yet recipient's actual logging on is not necessary for victim to escape being shot. Victim has already escaped cursor when the letter reaches recipient and let's assume recipient knows this. Still, recipient does not know who victim is, has no way of contacting or interacting with victim and hence no means of offering victim anything. So in this case, it seems recipient cannot permissibly log on and victim's consent to recipient log recipient logging on is invalid. But it seems incredibly difficult for a few like mine, a recipient focused few to explain this. That's because the characteristic feature of fuse like mine and, and other similar fuse um, is to explain the invalidity of consent as well as why acting on such consent is wrong in terms of another prior wrong which the person receiving consent committed e.g. when recipient coerces victim um, or in any other significantly, a significant way wrongs victim during the process of obtaining consent. That is before victim consents. But in this case, there is no such process of obtaining consent anymore and thus no possibility for recipient to wrong victim before victim consents. The only occasion for wrongdoing arises when recipient actually acts on victim's consent. But the wrong in acting on invalid consent is the explanandum, the thing we ought to explain, not the explanans, the thing that does the explaining. Thus, recipient focused views like mine seem to be unable to explain the invalidity of consent in these cases and therefore doomed to fail. So that's a tough challenge from Cursor, but I think um, I can have a reply to that and therefore, and thereby also go beyond. Uh, other views in the literature, and because to the best of my knowledge, there's no explicit solution to these kinds of cases. And I, the solution that I want to offer basically takes three steps. So first, I want to come back to my uh, the part in my account where I talk about facilitating coercive success. Recall, I, I said that when a recipient facilitates coercive success, when she denies a victim an alternative to acting on consent which would also allow victim to avoid the threatened harm and not impose an unreasonable cost on recipient. So usually an alternative is another way to escape the threatened harm. In my earlier example, mischievous, 
the recipient could provide such an alternative by giving coercer a call and making him withdraw this threat. However, an alternative can take other forms too, even the form of an omission. And in envelope, it does. Simply by not logging on, can recipient make it the case that victim not only avoids the physical injury, the threatened harm, but also the exposure of the bank account, what victim was forced to consent to. Moreover, not logging on doesn't impose unreasonable costs on recipient. And recipient should assume that victim would ask recipient not to log on if able to communicate freely. So if recipient logs on, he facilitates coercive success and thereby invalidates consent in my view. Now the crucial point when he logs on is that there are two wrongs, not just one. He commits two wrongs simultaneously. When he logs on, he facilitates coercive success and acts on invalid consent. Now these are distinct wrongs because facilitating coercive success when there's a feasible alternative is wrongful independently of whether consent is involved. Yet in my view, they're not independent wrongs because the facilitation of coercive success still explains why consent is invalid in the first place and acting on it wrong. In other words, the facilitation, facilitation of coercive success may not be temporarily prior to acting on invalid consent, but it is explanatorily prior. And this is the third step, this distinction between explanatory and temporal priority. So let me briefly illustrate this with a story. Greek mythology tells us that the moment King Midas touches food, he turns it into gold and renders it inedible. The conversion into gold and the inedibility of food happen at the same time. Yet, one explains the other. The food is inedible because it is golden, rather than the food is golden because it is inedible. Thus, the story of Midas supports the distinction between temporal and explanatory priority. Two things may happen at the same time, yet one explains the other. I want to tell you a very similar story about um, envelope. My view holds that the moment recipient acts on consent and logs on, he facilitates coercive success and renders consent invalid. Thus, just as the conversion into gold explains the inedibility of food, the facilitation of coercive success explains the invalidity of consent. Denying victim a feasible alternative instantly disqualifies recipient as someone receiving victim's permission. The fact that everything happens at the same time doesn't preclude this explanatory order. So I want to suggest that this is a way in which recipient focus view can deal with cases like envelopes, envelope. Uh, and my three-step solution, I think, provides uh, a novel approach to these cases. So let me conclude. I tried to do three things today, three key claims. I want to do, describe the challenge. In cases of consent and third-party coercion, two very plausible principles cannot both be true without qualification, the coercion principle and the permissibility principle. I gave you a solution. I argued for a modified coercion principle according to which consent is invalid if obtained by coercion and valid if merely motivated by coercion. And then I added a defense, presented a reply to what has so far appeared to be a decisive objection against any recipient focused view. Cases in which consent is invalid, but there is no interaction between victim and recipient prior to victim's consent. Okay. Thanks again for your attention. I really appreciate it. And also thanks for my very patient three protagonists. Thank you very much um, for the talk. Uh, we